All right. Welcome to Rich Conversations. I am joined all the way from Singapore by Joe Kim. Welcome back to the show. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to be back. It's been uh, quite a few years, right, Rich? Yeah. Yeah. It's been maybe like uh, two, two and a half years. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, like the last time you were on, you were discussing how you haven't really been able to take trips. You're really big into astronomy. You love using the telescope and taking photos of all, all mm -hmm. things in space. Yep. And you were kind of in lockdown in Singapore. So you, you yes. felt kind of constricted yes, by it. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So since then it's, uh, we've opened up, I mean, the whole world is open up. So, yeah. uh, yes, I have had the opportunity to travel around and resume uh, my usual astro trips, which is usually to Malaysia, and also took uh, to to further places as well, like uh, Australia and the US. So, all right, yeah, I'm excited to hear about this. Uh, we'll discuss it a little bit later. First, I want to like something I think is so cool is that we have the technology to in the present communicate with each other, even though mm -hmm. we're like 13 hours away. Yeah. And from our backgrounds, I'm I have this morning light coming on me and you have the shades. It looks like yep. night. It looks like nighttime <laughs> it, by you. Yep, it is night. It is night. It's it's bright yeah. only because of my lights. I've turned them on so that you can see me. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so you have like artificial light. I have some natural light and mm -hmm, you have your mm -hmm, telescope mm -hmm. in the background. Very fitting uh, for our yeah. conversation today and, and, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. your interests. Um, we were talking about this before we were recording about the moon and it's a f sort of a full moon right now. What I'm noticing, yep. it's so bright outside. I'm, I'm now in the countryside in, uh, mm -hmm. America, rural Wisconsin. And when I'm out at night, there are shadows, you know, the moon yeah, is so bright the moon, that there right? are shadows yeah. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it's been really interesting. Could you, share a little yes. bit of knowledge about the moon and the full moon mm -hmm. yeah so basically when when the moon is full it's it's bigger it's brighter and it's directly opposite uh the sun right so if you think of the sun on this side the earth and then the moon is directly opposite on the opposite side of the earth on the sun or rather the opposite side of the sun so it's on this side so it's going to be reflecting all of the sun's light towards us and that's why it appears very bright as well and of course it being full you know if you're getting 100 percent of the of the moon illuminate illuminating us yeah and i think for you being in the countryside with less light mm -hmm. you know the effect of the brightness from the moon is going to be much more than for say me in the city where we've got street lights and everything, which yeah. drowns out the light from the moon. Yeah. Huh. Let me uh, adjust my, the sun is <laughs> so bright here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, so there are like kind of folk tales about when the moon is full, like weird mm -hmm. or strange things happen more often. Do you do you think there's anything to that as far as the moon and humans and mm, I would say folk tales are surely mostly legends. <laughs> but uh the moon being out, and I think as you can experience now in the countryside, you you'll be able to see more things at night, right? The mm -hmm. the landscape might be illuminated a little bit more. So yeah. I think maybe that's why you start to have, or rather there are stories where you might be able to see things uh, when the full moon is out because, uh, yeah, perhaps it starts to light up certain parts of landscapes, certain things which you may not usually expect to see on nights when the moon is not so high up or not so bright. Yeah. And I think that certain animals might also, I mean, I think it does affect wildlife. I'm not very sure how. But I have a feeling that, or rather, I'm quite sure that it does affect animals to some extent. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I'm sure it, if it's lighter outside too, it might encourage mm -hmm. humans to go out more, which yeah. means there's more just interaction with environments, interaction mm -hmm. with other people, um, kind of thing. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So more chances for stories to to come out. Yeah, I've been really admiring the moon the last couple of days. It's been really mm -hmm. spectacular, and then especially with the cloud, there'll be some clouds in the way and it has these really cool scenes. I, I've enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the weather where you are is generally much better than here in Singapore because uh, in fact, for the past few weeks, it's been very cloudy. Yeah. Oh, really? So okay. We've only had glimpses of the moon here and there and out of okay. the past, maybe 10 nights only, one night was partially clear at best. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So yeah, that, uh, that, that's what it is in Singapore. Yeah. So it's night it, by it, you. It's generally like that. Yeah. So it's it's night by you. Um, it will be morning soon. Mm -hmm. A question I've been asking people is like, what on your best day? What does your ideal morning look like? I I think you're asking about like how I would prefer best to spend my mornings, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would say it's generally doing my own stuff, obviously. Uh, so maybe waking up, doing a little bit of exercise, a short run maybe, and then okay. just a, a nice relaxed breakfast with, say, my girlfriend or any of my friends. Yeah, uh, like a cup of coffee and tea, some toast. Yeah. Okay. So, so in in Singapore, what's interesting is we do have our own versions of coffee and tea like here we call it uh kopi and tea so okay. basically i think in the us or in most of the western world you use arabica beans whereas in singapore or this part of the world in southeast asia especially we the the traditional coffee is made using robusta beans yeah so there's a slight difference in taste okay yeah yeah huh. do you prefer coffee or tea I like both actually. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I'm I'm probably one of the rare people who like both, and really enjoy both. <laughs> I like herbal tea. I haven't gotten into the green tea or black tea though. Mm -hmm, I just, mm -hmm. what kind of tea do yeah. you drink when you do? Uh, I would prefer black, but okay. I do enjoy green tea as well. Uh, not so much on the herbal teas, but. Uh, I do drink them as well because I am quite caffeine caffeine sensitive. So yeah, it's probably just balancing out caffeine intake with okay. other kinds of teas, other kinds of drinks. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so we've been talking about Singapore. Something I'm curious about, what would you say right now the most talked about topic in Singapore is? among people mm, i think especially given that recently it's been very hot uh in in general in the world but the the heat wave has also hit singapore it is one of the complaints or the topics that i think most people would talk about at some point in the past few weeks yeah the i mean the temperature in a few weeks ago in july and august was extremely high especially in july like i think it hit um 35 degrees celsius which is yeah i'm not sure how that converts to fahrenheit but it's very high and, so, <laughs> and then add that to add with given that there's also a very high humidity here yeah the moment we like the moment i stepped out it's five minutes later i'm i'm soaked in sweat yeah so really? yeah temperature global warming in general, it's it's something which is talked about here a lot, but I think it's more towards like, uh, uh, say for example, air conditioner usage. How can we keep ourselves cool while maybe saving a bit more on the electricity? Yeah. Okay. So that, that's so, one area. So is this heat abnormal for Singapore? It's. It's, I mean, it's not abnormal to have heat, but the heat that we experienced this year was, yeah, starting to become a little bit abnormal. 
Mm. Yeah, but as I said, in the past like two or three weeks, it's been quite cloudy, so that has helped with the heat quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do people talk about climate change in Singapore? Uh, not specifically for action, but it's more like, oh, it's affecting us. It's making us making our weather hotter. Is making life like less comfortable. Yeah. Okay. So. We do talk about it, but not so much like wanting to take action. Yeah. So there's not, there's like an acknowledgement of climate change, mm. but not yes. really like a, mm -hmm. um, an urgency or like a view yeah. of, of it as being like threatening immediately. Uh, yeah, I, I think you could say that, or at least we, we feel it, but you know, it, it, I, I, most of us have the mindset of, or at least the general mindset is like, what we do is probably not going to impact climate change that much. Or like, it's already so hot, so we need mm -hmm. to try to survive ourselves by using the air conditioner or using whatever means we have to stay cool. Yeah. Oh. Interesting. So, what do you What do you think Singapore does great as a city? And as well, really like an independent state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, as you said, it's an independent state. And it's been very politically stable. And I think that is something that a lot of us take for granted. But I think it is something which, yeah, Singapore has done very great to do. And the government has done a very great job of maintaining this political stability. Yeah, because we are such a small nation. Uh, I mean, our economy is actually very volatile, but yet the government has done a pretty good job of keeping it stable. So in a sense, I am quite proud of uh, where we are as a nation today. And therefore, I'm still staying in Singapore. Yeah. Um, now, when you say politically stable, what exactly do you mean by that? Mm hmm. Or maybe not just politically stable, but in terms of like culturally and in terms of uh, life, it is generally very stable. So yeah, politically, because we don't have any issues with uh, uh, like governments disagree with the people or uh, let, let's say, for example, take our neighboring countries, for, for example, like Myanmar, they have... Uh, pretty much like a civil war going on there. Uh, our direct neighbors, Malaysia and Thailand, they are more stable as well. But yeah, there are other countries in the region which are not so, do not enjoy as much political stability as us in Singapore. So yeah. governments change, you know, there can be riots and stuff like that from time to time in our neighboring countries. But so far, Singapore has not really experienced much of that in the recent years. Yeah. Yeah, I've, yeah. Singapore is on the list of places to visit. Mm -hmm. I I feel like it's pretty yeah. interesting there how it's a uh... multicultural, right? It's it's and... like a uh, so I'm I'm a big fan of this thing called the Global Cities Index. Have you heard mm -hmm. of it? Uh I've heard of it, but I'm not exactly sure, you know. So it's what, it's what it is. it's essentially like it takes all these different categories. Mm -hmm. Um I'm I'm a big fan of cities in general. I think they're a great invention by humans throughout time, but um, they're engines of ideas and commerce and uh, culture. But this this Global Cities Index takes mm -hmm. maybe like thirty categories. It's like institutions, economic mm -hmm. powerhouse, culture, like all yeah, these different yeah. things, and then it ranks the cities in the world and it has these tiers so there's this top tier i think uh i've lost your the connection connection get lost your audio i can't
Can you hear me now? Uh, hello? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yes. I think. Okay. Uh, but uh, can you still hear me now? I can hear you and see you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you hear is me? my voice okay? Uh, yes. Yes. Now I can hear you. Yeah, I can. I can hear you good. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Then let's continue like this. I think there was some connection issue again. Oh, uh, with the the yeah. headphones, maybe. Uh, maybe I'm not. I'm not exactly sure what what caused the issue, but yeah, let's, oh. let's try like this then. <laughs> yeah. So the yeah. okay. So the global cities index has these tiers, and there's like two top cities in the world they consider, and that's New York and London. And then there's about eight cities that are in this next tier and Singapore is one of them. And mm. so it's really interesting to see, um, I would like to experience those cities. I like going to cities and then kind of, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know, learning and, and experiencing how they approach things, how they do things and how it compares to other cities. It's, it's just fascinating to me. So Singapore is right up there. I, I do want to visit Singapore someday. <laughs> yeah, that, that 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 is nice to hear. <laughs> I I think it is quite unique. It's a uh, and I would say it's a good representation of the cultures in the Southeast Asian region. Yeah. Well, switching gears a little bit. You are in astronomy. I'm I'm energized to hear all these stories you've probably accumulated what's been your favorite yeah. astronomical experience you've had since our last conversation yeah so i think that's one how that un undoubtedly is the total solar eclipse so okay. i have yeah i have actually experienced two total solar eclipses since our last conversation so uh the first one was in 2023 in yeah. Australia, in a, in the town or rather in a region called Exmouth, which is in the northwestern region of Australia. So, oh, wow. yeah, it's in a very remote part of Australia. It's very remote, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the the path of totality or the shadow, the moon's shadow, only traveled over that tiny little re region in Australia. So yeah, my my friend and I we made the journey up to Exmouth. <laughs> And we saw the total solar eclipse, and I think uh, it ha it hands down is the most magical natural phenomenon or any kind of phenomenon that any anyone can experience. Uh, it's literally out of this world. <laughs> you literally feel like you're in space. Really? Yeah. 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 It's uh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it it's completely different from a partial solar eclipse, and okay. a partial one is where the moon covers the sun, but not completely. So, yeah. so the the sun is still pretty bright, and your the ambient light is still very bright. Whereas in a total solar eclipse, the moon covers the sun completely, and it goes dark like it's evening time. You know, it's mm -hmm. twilight. And what happens is that uh, when the moon covers the sun, we are able to see the sun's outer atmosphere, which is the which is the corona. So you can imagine if let's say this is the sun, the moon mm -hmm. covers the sun, what you are left with is you, you can see the outer atmosphere of the sun. That's the corona, which is just hot okay. gases yeah, shooting out. And that is a really beautiful sight. Yeah. I mean, words cannot describe it. So was it? Let's try to put in words. Let's let's try yeah. to describe it. So you're there in a remote part of Australia. Mm -hmm. First, like, what was the journey like to get there? How much preparation did you do? And um, did you then get there and then have to travel farther in? to be somewhere mm -hmm. even more remote? And what was that that journey so like? It wasn't too bad. Like there were proper roads going to okay. where we wanted to be. So it just was remote and we had to get there. So it was 
uh, the the total journey there and back was about more than three thousand kilometers. So I guess like what two thousand miles. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so a lot of preparations in the sense of like planning, booking accommodations along the way. Ah, yes, and obviously these accommodations have to be booked way in advance, at least one year, if not, yeah, two years. So we we got our accommodation booked more than a year in advance, and that's what got us going on the trip and we continue to plan the rest of the trip around the accommodation that we managed to get. Yeah, because total solar eclipses are very popular. Like it's it's a rare phenomenon and everyone wants to see it. So yeah, a lot of planning. So and then uh, yeah. You knew the exact days that this would happen then? Yeah, the exact moment down to the minute, down to the second. You a could year calculate in advance. It. Yeah. And in fact, you can see, you can you can find uh, information on solar eclipses for the next hundred years or so. It's all online, and, and it all it, and then yeah. it happens like clockwork. Mm -hmm. Yes, just like clockwork. So, for example, in twenty twenty three, it was on the twentieth of April, and I, if I remember correctly, it was at about eleven twenty a.m. in the morning. So that was when totality would happen, which is when the moon covers the sun. And the moon only covered the sun for 63 seconds. So 63 it's like, seconds. Yeah, so we drove for like days for 63 seconds. And yeah. I would say yeah. like, it's the most worth it. It's the best thing I've ever done. Really? Yeah. Wow. For 63 seconds. So, okay, let's... Put me in the mindset of those 63 seconds. Like first, what, what are you seeing? Yeah, so uh, a few minutes before totality, which is when it gets completely dark. So a few minutes before that, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, uh, you can start to feel the ambient light getting less. So it still feels like day, but mm -hmm. it just feels darker. Like it feels like a very strange shade of day, like maybe a very cloudy day. But yet it just doesn't feel cloudy because it's not cloudy. Yeah. <laughs> and if you have eclipse glasses or solar filters and you look at the sun, then you would see the sun as a crescent because part of it is blocked by the moon. So you yeah. see it as a crescent. Then about five minutes before totality, uh, for us in Australia, we got lucky because this phenomenon is quite rare. This phenomenon is shadow bands. So what happens is about five minutes before totality, suddenly we see these shadows and streaks coming across uh, the ground. It's like if you're in a swimming pool and you're looking at the floor of the swimming pool, you see those rays coming from the sun, right? Oh, those yeah. waves. Yeah. So that you, you could see that happening, like just there, you know, uh -huh. all around us. And then with about one minute to go, it started to really dim. The, the colors, the ambient colors all look very strange. And yeah, so basically you feel like you are in a in a movie set or you're on another planet at that point. And then right when the moon fully covers the sun is when you suddenly feel a very sharp drop in brightness. And yeah, everything goes dark. So... I was actually looking out to the west where where the shadow would come in from. So you could I could actually see the moon's shadow uh, coming in the form of like the landscape in the west darkening, 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 darkening. And then like with about five or ten seconds to go, I knew this shadow was gonna engulf all, all of us. And yeah, so once that happened, I looked up, I saw the sun, which was now no longer the sun because it was blocked by the moon. And I saw the corona and it was, uh, yeah, I, I was just shocked. Let's just say that I grew up looking at pictures of solar eclipses, reading about it, you know, loving astronomy. So I thought like maybe I knew what to expect or like I could guess what to expect. But it completely exceeded <laughs> what I could ever imagine. Yeah, so I was just left there literally with my jaw dropped open, like, yeah. So, 
But I would say that why it it was so moving or so shocking was because of the immense differences in brightness. Yeah. So the 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 inner corona near the sun is actually was actually really bright. And then the corona itself stretched out much further than I expected. Yeah. yeah so it was very interesting for sure. Did the temperature drop too? Yes, the temperature dropped. So about five degrees or ten Fahrenheit at least. Okay. Yeah. So you could feel it. You could feel the, the yeah. difference. Yeah. 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 And 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 the the other interesting thing the other interesting thing was that there was some wind. Like in the morning of the eclipse, there was a very strong westerly wind coming from the west. And then about 20 minutes before totality, that wind completely stopped, which was very strange. And then after, after totality, I think the wind started to pick up a little bit. Like it was, it became a breeze. Wow. But during totality, there was no wind, which was just really weird because the whole morning, the wind was really strong. Yeah, so I think it's to do with the, the temperature drop and things like that, how it affects the, the, the local weather in the area. Hmm. So is that that's right up there for human experiences you've had? Yes. No, I mean, whether you like astronomy or not, as long as I think as long as you like appreciate nature, then that is something everyone has to do, has to see in their lifetime at least once. Yeah. Uh, I think my favorite quote describing a total solar eclipse that I've read online, it's not mine, is uh, it describes the difference between uh, the partial eclipse before the sun is completely covered and the total. So it, it says that a partial eclipse is like, seeing a partial eclipse is like going to the opera, but watching it from the outside of the opera house. <laughs> like you've just completely missed the whole show. Uh -huh. Yeah. So that that's that's how different it is once the sun is completely covered. Hmm. So you have this experience. What what goes through your mind? Because you went to another partially quit eclipse this year, right? Yeah, a total, another total eclipse. <laughs> Okay so, so, okay, so you went to, the yeah. first one was in Australia. Where was the Last second year. one? Uh, so the second one was this year, 2024. And I think, I'm not sure if you were aware of it. It, it cut through the US. So it, it went down from, from Mexico right up through to the US. Uh, so Mexico, Texas, Arkansas, and all the way to New York and, and uh I think New Brunswick, yeah, that was roughly the path of totality. This so this, this yeah. was uh, big in the U.S. Mm. It uh, it yeah. was like a a big deal. People took time out of their days. Like, there's very few things in America that really kind of transcend daily life, and all people talk about now because everybody's kind of in their own little mm -hmm. spaces. Mm -hmm everybody's talking about the solar eclipse and everybody's planning their days around the solar eclipse. I went up on the, the rooftop of our building and there are people and neighbors I've never seen all together, like sharing this moment and this space. Um, it was a cool thing because there, there are, are less and less things in the world that, that kind of mm -hmm. do that. And I think space, yeah. that's a great example of space yeah, but it, creating it, it's the this one thing, thing that transcends yeah. the human. Yeah, the one thing which we all experience together. Yeah, yeah. And like, it's like this wonder. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So where were you for that? So, uh, for that, uh, I did quite a bit of planning, and I looked at the weather, and or rather the climate, and. The area which has the best climate with the least probability of clouds was in uh, around Mexico. If not, then it would be Texas. So for me, it was between Mexico or Texas. 
And for most other eclipse chasers and astronomers, it was between Mexico or Texas. Okay. Uh, yeah. But so in Texas, it was about a 50% chance of cloud around April. And in Mexico, it's about 40% chance of cloud. So not that much better in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And my strategy in the end was I managed to find a cruise which started, which started in LA and it cruised down to Mexico. And the, the reason why I chose a cruise was because if there were clouds and there were, then the cruise could move to an area with no clouds. Huh. And that Here you go. Here you with go. the amazing navigational skills of the captain, we managed to see the total solar eclipse off the coast of Mexico. Wow. Yeah. So it was on a cruise right in the middle of nowhere. We were about 200 kilometers from land, 200 kilometers from Mazatlan. So, so yeah. if you're, if the captain of the ship didn't move, you wouldn't have seen it? No. Wow. We would not have seen it. Yeah. That's, so, you really thought ahead. You did your diligence. Yes, and I guess that shows how impactful an experience the first total solar eclipse for me was. Like, I think what drove me to go again was that in 2023 in Australia, I went with my friend. And the very next morning, I thought to myself, I could not live not having shared this experience with my partner, my girlfriend. Oh, wow. so yeah I, I decided okay let's go next year because somehow our schedules allowed for it and yeah who knows what might happen in the future so i started to plan found the cruise and i knew that was the right option huh. did you go with anybody on the cruise uh no it's just me and my girlfriend okay yeah but obviously, on the cruise itself, we met a lot of other either eclipse enthusiasts or other astronomers, like myself, amateur astronomers. So it was a very interesting cruise, specifically for the eclipse. That makes me so happy <laughs> that you you took those steps. I can't, like... Are you a good planner? I think so. <laughs> yeah, yes. it because, like it. because astronomy is a, you know, it's a very complicated hobby, very technical. And there are a lot of things that could go wrong, especially if you're talking about astrophotography, imaging, you know, the cameras, the electronics. So there's always a lot of planning, whether it be with the setup itself, like the mm -hmm. telescope, or planning in terms of the travel yeah, and the luggage equipment packing yeah so this cruise were you how long was the cruise then uh it was a 10-day cruise it's a 10-day and... cruise and how long was the total solar eclipse so one entire day was dedicated to the solar eclipse okay. like yeah so we had pots of coal in the days leading up to the solar eclipse to get the screws down to Mexico. And then once we were in Mexico, uh, our port of call before the solar eclipse was in Mazatlan, which would be one of the towns in totality, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, but the next day, there was no port of call. It was a day at sea. And it was a day for the captain to sail out to try to mm -hmm. sail to the best sky, best weather. And then the next part of call was the next day. So basically one full day was dedicated to allowing the captain to chase the eclipse. Oh. And so the, the yes. first one you experienced was 63 seconds of yes. total. Yes. What, total. what was this other one, the second one? So this one was four minutes and 25 seconds. Yeah, so four and a half minutes. So what, what creates the difference between the two in time? Yeah, so it's basically just the distance of the Earth to the Moon, the, or rather the Moon to the Earth. 
So if let's say the moon is a little bit closer to the Earth, let's say this is the sun, this is the moon. If it's closer to the Earth, you see the moon would appear bigger, so it blocks yeah. out more yeah. of the sun. Okay. So the sun stays covered for a longer time as the moon, you know, glides past the sun from our perspective. Wow. Yeah. So it's a, it, it was a magical experience. Um, there were a lot of other couples on the cruise as well, although most of them were much older than us, much older than myself. But yeah, it was a very interesting experience. What goes through your mind after after the eclipse, right? So after those, uh, you said four and a half minutes, right? Yeah. Do you feel relief? Like all that planning, so. everything, and you did it kind of thing? Uh, yes, for sure. <laughs> yes, yeah, that, that for sure. Uh, okay, in terms of the relief, actually, uh, my camera had a bit of an issue. So uh -oh. I automated it, but somehow the automation didn't really work as planned. So mm -hmm. I had to manually trigger it with my with my with my hand. Okay. Uh, so mm -hmm. I was a bit like, oh, did I get the pictures I wanted? But other than that, yeah. yes, relief that you know we saw the eclipse uh, under perfect skies. Well, you know, I had friends. I had a friend in Mazatlan. I had friends in Texas. And they saw the eclipse, but it was through a layer of cloud. So it, it, I think it was not as good as what we saw. But yeah, other than relief, actually, I would say it feels like being born again. It's like, Ooh. like a spiritual <laughs> renewal. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's crazy. It's, yeah. It, yeah, it, it's like new life. So it's new energy. Like I'm right? blessed by by the solar system and the universe. Wow. As crazy as that sounds. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So so that's why I say it's uh it's something which I hope that everyone who has the means to do it would experience at least once in their life. Yeah. So are you planning a third one now? Uh yeah. <laughs> so the next total solar eclipse is in 2026 in Spain oh. and then yeah so that's the next one in the world there's no total solar eclipse for the next two years until then yeah and then 2027 it goes to Spain again uh, Gibraltar Egypt and Saudi Arabia a few other countries in in that region and in 2028 is in Australia so yeah I have plans for Quite a few of the things. <laughs> so it's it's quite crazy. They say that once you see your first, either you're like, it was amazing, but one is enough, or you're like, it's amazing. I need a second one now, but you realize, oh, I'll wait like one or two years. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> Spain, Spain, that's a great place to visit. Yes, for sure. It's, so it would be you're going to be out more in uh, rural areas of Spain to see it. What what cities nearby would you spend some time in? Mm, I mean, just for logistics purpose, Singapore has a direct flight to Barcelona, I think. So, okay. yeah, that will be the main travel destination for me. I've not been to Spain, so I think that will be a nice trip. <laughs> Barcelona, for a long time, I told people Barcelona is my favorite city in the world that I visited. I see. Okay. Barcelona has a a lot like, going for it. Mm. It's really neat. Um, so I hope you get some time. What, to, what, what to do you like about it? The, the culture or the architecture or something? Um, I think one thing that uh, makes me a little biased is that I feel like maybe one of three of the best days I've had in the last 10 years, one of them was in Barcelona. And it was this, it was like kind of random. It was on a Sunday. It was April, 2018. And 
there was a, there's a neighborhood called Val de Hebron and my last name's Hebron. So I'm like, oh, I'm going to check this out. And it's not a touristy area. It's just like locals. And so I go up to, I go up to this neighborhood and I'm just walking around and then I kind of get lost and I didn't eat breakfast and I was like starved. So I had to figure out Spanish and there was this family, this like restaurant and I ate there. And then I was like, kept walking around like up on the hills, like kind of in the hills or mountains or whatever it is. Barcelona is right on the water too, right on the coast. And it was like maybe 75 to 80 degrees, beautiful day. So I'm walking around there, come back down. Then I go all the way down to the water and then I'm on the beach for a while. Then I walk to the Gothic quarter and I'm uh, very enthusiastic about like history and I like experiencing old buildings and um, just kind of walking in the past in a way and admiring um, that kind of thing. So there's like a Gothic quarter mm. that um, that is there, but there was a holiday too. It was mm. like their they're kind of like Valentine's Day and they had all these Catalonian flags and they were selling roses all over the city. So I was in all these different parts of the city. They were selling roses and the women buy the roses and give them to the men on the, on that day. And then at night is El Clasico or was El Clasico and it's Barcelona, FC Barcelona versus Real Madrid. And I went to, I just went to a bar and watched it and it was super close the whole time. And then Messi, Messi scored the winning goal within literally one minute of the end of the game. And the whole place just erupts. People pour out into the streets and there's just like this big mob and this, uh, just so much noise. And then I just like joined it and I'm like, <laughs> it's like in it. And it was just like so beautiful. And it was also um, that trip was the first time I ever been out of the country. And mm -hmm. I remember like my feet in the Mediterranean and thinking, oh, wow, I, I finally did it. I finally like left the country, left the U.S. This is my first trip. And so it was a lot of like different things going on. But Barcelona, I thought the food was great. The weather's great. Um People seem to have a lot of energy. The architecture was really cool. Just a lot of a lot of stuff going for it. Very vibrant mm -hmm. and more, more like laid back, more artistic, a little bit more kind of bohemian than Madrid. Madrid is a little bit more buttoned up. It's the capital. Uh, mm -hmm. You have all like kind of your national museums and institutions mm -hmm. there. Barcelona is mm -hmm. kind of the chill, like laid back city in spain i feel like yeah that, that that's very interesting to hear yeah especially with the with the football i think it's quite a craze yeah. in europe right yeah. yeah yeah um what what other trips do you have have you taken besides to, uh total solar eclipses and what ones you have coming up that aren't total solar eclipses I know you spent a lot of time in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Malaysia is just the... I would say it's the regular astronomy trip for me. Like, uh, it's quite light polluted in Singapore. So if we want to do anything that, that requires darker skies, which is looking at dimmer objects like galaxies, nebula, uh, yeah, we usually go to Malaysia. These days I go like um, with my girlfriend and my friend who's been my observing buddy since we were quite young. Uh, yeah, so those are, it's interesting. We still look at the sky, but uh, we are, you know, it, it it's darker, but it's still not very dark in Malaysia. And being, still being in the tropics means that uh, the cloud situation, the weather isn't much better. So, yeah, in terms of the sky quality, it's still not uh, pristine. It's not that wow kind of sky. Okay. So, uh, both on my trip 
last year to Australia for the total solar eclipse. And recently this year, uh, I made trips to Western Australia, different parts of Western Australia, mm -hmm. uh, specifically for astronomy as well. So okay. it is much darker because, yeah, it's much more rural and the weather is much better as well. So there is much less moisture in the air. So, and this allows the sky to be more transparent. And then with those kind of conditions, you know, the Milky Way almost pops out at you. But it's what I've learned is that it's not quite like the pictures. It's a bit of a different experience because uh, we are looking at something very dim. And the way the brain perceives it is quite different from looking at a picture. So yeah, yeah. this yeah. Milky Way spanning across the entire sky and looking very, very huge. Yeah. So it's nice to visit, you know, that kind of dark sky, which we don't get in Singapore. Do you ever feel yeah. that when you you take photos of of these things? Your photos are great, of course. Mm -hmm. Do you ever feel kind of disappointed because it, it, the photos still don't capture the magic of it? Yeah, you, and it, it's a very good point to make because uh, I think up until a few years ago, I have been quite focused on taking photos. But uh, yeah, in the recent few years, like the past two or three years, I have decided to shift my focus more towards visual, like observing with my eye, be it the naked eye mm -hmm. or with my eye through my telescope, rather than putting a camera onto it and, and going through the whole astrophotography process. And yeah, what the eye sees is very different from what we see in the picture. For one, we cannot actually see much color at night. But I would say that it looks different because a screen or a photo cannot capture the dynamic range or the range of brightness that the, mm -hmm. the eye can see. So a photo is always going to look artificial. But with the eye, you know, it gives you a bit more context as to where we are. Mm -hmm. If you're looking with the naked eye, it gives you context. Like that's that's the Milky Way you look up. Yeah. Yeah. If I'm looking through a telescope, you know, it gives me context in the sense like, oh, this nebula is actually quite big. Uh, it's it's got parts which are dimmer, got parts which are brighter. And oh, this star here is very bright. You know, it's very easy to tell with your eye through a telescope. But on a picture, it may not show up. You know, maybe most of the nebula has been brightened and you don't really get the, the sense of where it's dark, where it's bright. Yeah. So it's this kind of very subtle, the subtleties are what make observing visually much, much, uh, much more like, like a more, more engaging experience than looking at a photo. Yeah. yeah. But you, you you mentioned before about automating the photos. Do you do you practice that more? Like you automate it more, and then you can focus more with the naked eye, or yeah. So the problem is that the effort it takes to automate the photos or the entire process is actually uh, it can depending on how lucky you are with your setup and how adept you are. Uh, it can actually take up quite a bit of effort. And so lately I've been moving towards, okay, I'm just going to focus on the visual and really just enjoy what the night sky has to give to me. And I found like I get a lot more personal satisfaction out of, out of that. Yeah. Okay. So you, you've abandoned taking photos. No, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say abandoned, but you know, okay. it's, a, it, 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 it's a shift in focus. Just I'll like when I did. Focus. Yeah, just like when I did more astrophotography, uh, I still did visual. I still looked through the telescope and I still enjoyed it. But 
I tended to want to focus on taking pictures. Okay. But now it's like most of the time I'm planning trips around doing visual astronomy, looking with my eye. And if I could squeeze in a photo of two, maybe. But it's not a priority mm -hmm. anymore. Yeah. Is your telescope <laughs> set up the same as the last time we talked? Uh, no. I've you built my own telescope. I've designed and built my own telescope because I wanted one that was airline portable so that oh. I could take it to Australia. Yeah. Interesting. So for a telescope that size or with that kind of performance, yeah, it is usually not airline portable. So being a mechanical engineer myself, I said, okay, I'm going to figure out how to you know, make this whole thing more compact so that I can bring it to Australia. And I think one of the drivers for me to do that was that there actually aren't many options on the market for such telescopes, which are easily portable. So I thought, okay. you know, I, I would try to design one myself and see if it can be better than any of those that are currently available. Okay. Yeah. So what was that process like and like uh like technically kind of what did you change and and, and so basically a telescope is just a, a lens or okay. in the case of my telescope a mirror which reflects light or focuses the light into, into a point and then after that an eyepiece which you look through so uh the main bulk of the design work was figuring out how to build the structure around it. So I looked at other people's designs online and then I started to think what are the best designs, what are the compromises which I might have to make in the design, uh, how to make it more easily manufactured. And then I did the design, the 3D model. Uh, I sent it out to manufacturers somewhere else. I mean, I did not do the machining myself, but uh, yeah, everything else. Uh, I designed and then after that assembled everything and started to test it, troubleshoot it and try to make it get it to a point where I actually enjoyed using it and so now I really do enjoy using that telescope so yeah the hard work has pretty much paid off so you're using <laughs> now a telescope that you designed uh, yeah so obviously uh, optical components were purchased. There were quite a lot of purchased parts, okay. but the overall frame, the structure of it is my own design. That's cool. It's not this one. It, it's, it, it's kept somewhere else. How many telescopes do you own then? Uh, so this one's actually a new one. This one's for the sun. I just got it like a month ago. Uh, so including this, it would be, I have this, I have another one of similar size, so that's two. Uh, I have my previous telescope, which is an eight inch Schmidt Cassegrain, so it's eight inches in diameter aperture, so it's quite big. Uh, three, four, so I would say about four, four telescopes. So I'm, there are many enthusiasts who own way more telescopes than me, but uh, yeah, I, I, I keep what I feel is necessary and I, I just enjoy all of them. So yeah, I'm not quite a collector. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> I prefer uh, to spend on experiences. Yeah. Now the one, the one you designed to make it more portable, what, what size is it? Like, how does it compare to that one? And, mm -hmm. um, what does the case look like? Like, what do you carry it in? Uh, so it fits into a medium-sized luggage. So like a carry-on? Yeah, not 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 carry-on. Just a normal medium-sized luggage. Okay. So the twenty-four inch, so about twenty-four inch size luggage. Uh, when it's fully set up, it's about one meter tall, and okay. the, the the primary mirror, which is the aperture, is about. 10 inches it's 10 inches so it's about this this big yeah. it's about this this wide and then you know, it goes it goes from the floor up 
about about this height you know about okay. waist or above chest level yeah so so it's quite a big telescope and if if I did not or if if you don't get one that can be dismantled then there's no way you could travel with a telescope that size because it would be like you know quite huge yeah <laughs> or at least you know you would have to consider more complicated shipping options yeah. okay but the way you designed it it's more module modular yeah so everything modular. can be taken apart it uses a, a trusses okay. simply put trusses or, or, or tubes to support the whole structure yeah wow. now in the case to keep the parts safe do you did you design like a like an insulation for it at all or or do you like uh, no. clothes in it <laughs> I, i'm one of those who just goes with the crude way of using uh, whatever i have maybe put a bit of foam and then some clothes since i'm traveling right so clothes yeah. put them around okay i think a bit of foam here you know and, and and that reduces the amount of uh, luggage which I have to take with me on the trip. So, yeah, that's pretty much the way I've done it. The telescope has survived quite well. So, yeah, it's quite effective, I would say. <laughs> Obviously, you need a bit of luck, I guess. That's that's what's <laughs> kind of funny about it is you you spend all this effort and time designing your own telescope and planning these trips, and then you. <laughs> You just put clothes in the suitcase yes. and hope it works out. Got to have some luck. Yeah. That's, that's but I think, I think it's also because I know how the durability of the components, like I know which components are more fragile, which components need a bit more padding and which components are, you know, very robust. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I, I think, I think it's the, it's just the way I am, I guess. Yeah, yeah. it's funny. What, uh, the other what, thing is, is, uh, what in, what about space in general are you most curious about right now? Well, I, w I would say perhaps maybe just, uh, Yeah, maybe just seeing how vast the universe is mm. and mm. just being curious about, you know, the laws of physics, the more interesting laws of physics, like the grand unified theory, quantum mechanics, you know, how it relates to particle physics. Uh, yeah, it's something which I've always been curious about. Uh, so I think recently also I've started, I got this telescope because of my interest in the sun, also inspired by solar eclipses. Uh, yeah, so I think in the sun, there's a lot of nuclear physics going on. Uh, it, I do take some interest in it and I do like to read about it, you know, just general general science space kind of science yeah that, that's generally what interests me yeah the sun has a lot of power it sure does yeah <laughs> and, and there is a lot of things and activity going on mm -hmm. huh. so it's, it's very interesting to just read about it Yeah, it is. Well, we're kind of winding down our conversation. I have uh, a few questions left. I kind of just want to pepper you with. <laughs> One of them is, what consumer electronics device is your favorite or that you're most grateful for? So the first obvious answer is as an astrophotographer, as a person who likes imaging cameras, I mean, it's, it's made, I mean, it's changed most people's lives. It's changed the way we do 
astrophotography. And yeah, it has allowed astronomy and astrophotography to be a lot more accessible. But yeah, that's the that's an obvious answer. But I would say that if you ask me what else, uh, I was I was thinking about uh, gaming devices actually. So I'm not quite okay. a gamer, but I am big into motorsport, and okay. I am big into sim racing as well. So I have got a a, a small simulator with a steering wheel and, and a gaming PC. So uh, yeah, it has allowed me to experience motorsport without having any access to a racetrack. So yeah, gaming mm -hmm. devices, I would say. How? Uh, I want to say how accurate is the simulation compared to the like, real thing, but do you get a good sense of it? Like the simulation, does it do a pretty good job of? Yeah, it does. It does do a very good job of simulating the physics and the driving, uh, the driving styles, which you need to have. Uh, I mean, I've never raced a race car but i've i've gone go-karting with my friends you know yeah. for fun uh and what i learned on the simulator applies and translates directly to the go-kart track like oh, in terms okay. of how you brake how you steer things like that and obviously racecraft and awareness of just what's going on at the track and i mean race like professional race car drivers they themselves are also into sim racing so i think it does say something about how realistic it is yeah did you design that too or is that do you race as is uh i mean i assembled the simulator myself you know different parts here and there uh added a like base shakers at the bottom to vibrate the seat so yeah. as i go yeah. over bumps go over curbs uh, if the tires lock up or I lose grip, you know, I can feel all of this through the seat as well as through the steering wheel. So, yeah. Nice. <laughs> A bit of DIY work there as well. <laughs> uh, what are you curious about recently? Yeah. Uh, recently, I've been reading... Uh, trying to find books in the library. Like I've, I've just been looking, I went to the library wondering, okay, what else would I like to see? Could I pick out a new topic? And I think what I got interested in is geography. So geology, mm -hmm. geography, whatever. I started to read, like I've read one book now and now I'm reading another one on the atmosphere. So yeah, it's quite interesting. And I am quite, I wouldn't say surprised, but like I'm quite, happy to know how much physics is actually applied to just like the atmosphere. Like I am through this book about the atmosphere, I, I, I I'm reading about the laws of thermodynamics and how it applies to how parcels of air can expand, contract and move around, around the earth and cause weather systems and things like that. So it, it's really fascinating. Um, that is. <laughs> All right, last, last question for you. What are you energized for within the next six months? Uh, yeah, so being a motorsports fan, I am very excited about the Singapore Grand Prix, which is this weekend. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, nice. but in the longer term, I am hoping to get back to long distance running because for some reason, like, I've had, my health hasn't been the greatest, like with some food poisoning and, you know, COVID, like I've not been able to sustain the stamina needed for long distance running. So it used to be a hobby of mine, but that has like taken a, a bit of a, a bit of a backseat for now. But yeah, in the next six months, I am aiming and hoping to get back to long distance running. So probably about five to 10 Ks at the start. And hopefully, maybe to a half marathon soon that in the six in the first month or a year. I don't know. But yeah, that's great. That's great.
the Grand Prix <laughs> in Singapore, have they had a race like that before? Yeah, it's been going on. This is uh, the 15th year we're going to have. Okay. It. Yeah, so it's the Formula One race. Okay. Yeah. That's getting pretty popular. Yeah, it is very popular here. Yeah. Huh. yeah. How many times have you gone to that? Uh, I think 14 because I didn't go to the first, but I've been to every single one since. You've been to every single one? Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Uh, recently, on my trip to the US, when I was in LA, I also went to the Grand Prix of Long Beach. Wow. So that was quite cool. Like, I haven't been, like, or rather, since then, I've started watching IndyCar and following the series. And I think it's pretty cool with all the oval races, something yeah. which uh, the rest of the world does not have. Yeah. Yeah. America, we just, we just have. Kind of yeah, I, I used I used to think it was like, you know, boring. But uh -huh. now that I've started watching it, it's like, it's really cool, and it takes so much skill and precision. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, thanks for uh, having this chat today. This conversation, it's been been wonderful. Yeah, it's been a good catch up with you as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for coming on. Um, yeah, really enjoyed this. Yes, thanks. Most happy to. <laughs>